Rihanna, have we gone live? No, I'll let you know. Okay. Mr. Chairman, you are now live on YouTube. Okay, thank you. So, so for everyone who's watching and committee members, welcome to the first meeting uh, for this session for the Transportation, Highways and Military Affairs Committee. Um, uh, before we get started, just a, a few housekeeping things. Uh, um, just remember the decorum in the meeting um, with questions and that please address the chairman and, and refrain from addressing directly other members of the committee. Um, the same goes for the public. Um, keep the discussion on track. Um, I know we all have wonderful stories to tell, but we also need to get our business done. We have five, five bills to consider today. Um, and just ask that everybody be civil and respectful. And that's the directions we're to give before each meeting. A few other things, uh, you must be live on the screen to be participating in the meeting. And this is for committee members uh, and for votes, you do have to be live. Uh, you can't phone in, uh, you can't blank your screen. We have to be able to see you. Uh, that was in the rule that was passed uh, on the first day of this session. Uh, we'll take a break. Uh, around 2.45, give or take, depending on where we are in the bills. Um, and we also have a hard stop at 5.30, uh, and that's to give staff time to do all of the paperwork they need to do. So if we are in the middle of a bill, we'll just have to carry it over. Uh, if we come up to it and, and have a bill left, we'll carry it over to the next meeting. So, And mostly for members of the public, um, if you're not wishing to offer testimony, we ask that uh, you view on, on YouTube. Uh, for those wanting to testify, uh, you should register using the testify tab on the committee's web page, uh, meeting page, um, and you'll be admitted at the, at the appropriate time. Um, and once you've finished that testimony, you'll have to leave the meeting and then again, watch by YouTube. Um, so, with that, I would ask that uh, Carla, you take roll. Thank you, Chairman Burkhart. Um, Representative Baker, um, you're muted. Here. Uh, Representative Brown. Here. Representative Burt. Present. Representative Henderson. Here. Representative Obermuller. Here. Representative O'Hearn. Here. Representative Stivar. Present. Um, Vice Chairman McGuire. Present. And Chairman Burkhart. Here. All present. Thank you, Carl, very much. So the first bill for our consideration will be House Bill. 17 range management at military training areas and i think we're going to get some information on this from the military affairs department am i correct on that carla yes sir um, so i think general porter raised his hand and let me see if i can hit him. there you go uh, there we go. Mr. Chairman, I can certainly hear you if you can hear me. Yes, we can. All right. So, General, uh, if you would fill us in on uh, House Bill 17, uh, range management at military training areas. And I think you have some slides also, don't you? Um, I, I provided some slides for you, sir. I did not. Uh, I did not have them set up right now to do. But if you give me a few minutes, I probably could. Um, if we think that we that you need them, I think you can go ahead and just explain the the concept behind the bill. All righty, sir, uh, Mr. Chairman. I will do that. Uh, also with me, I have uh, Colonel Retired Chris Smith, who's our senior legal counselor. Um, in the room, and also uh, uh, Captain Jackie Stoneham, who was the executive officer here for the Wyoming Military Department's uh, uh, TAG office. Uh, greetings, Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the House Transportation and Military Affairs Committee. 
Uh, just a little background, if I could, on, on this bill. Um, this was not initially an interim topic for, for the committee. Um, this actually resulted from a decision that the Secretary of Defense made in June of this last summer, June of 2020. And what that decision was, wasn't necessarily targeted to fix the issue that we're gonna talk about today, but the military department in Wyoming got caught up as a result of the rule that the Secretary of Defense pushed out. And that was that the military the National Guard can no longer provide services if it is unreimbursable. So if, as most of you know, when we go on state active duty and we use equipment and that sort of thing, the state of Wyoming has to reimburse the federal government for the use of that equipment. They made really, uh, in, in attempting to fix some problems elsewhere in, in, the, uh, in the country, we got sort of caught up with in this grazing discussion because it turns out that um, the Wyoming Military Department was using some federal assets to manage the grazing program here in Wyoming, such as our, our environmental folks would, would be of assistance to, uh, to examining the ranges and recovering the ranges and that sort of stuff that we graze. And let me just back up very quickly because I made a, a bad assumption that uh, everybody understands when I say grazing what I'm talking about. We have in uh, Camp Guernsey is our, our military training facility. It's a little over 60,000 acres. We are one of two military um, um, posts in the nation that allows grazing on their, on their um, um, facilities. Uh, we do that for uh, probably two main reasons. The first one is fire mitigation and it's healthy to, to, to make sure that we have grazing in, uh, in our training areas. And secondly, we wanna be good neighbors to Platte County and, and our folks there that, uh, um, that have traditionally been grazing um, that land for many years. And so we have uh, tried very hard to maintain our ability to graze uh, at, at Camp Guernsey in our training areas. Um, so we, uh, uh, it, you know, just like any other place in, in the state, there are state lands under the control of the military department that we graze and allow um, our neighbors to, uh, to, to lease those just like uh, any, other, uh, any, any other leased uh, grazing uh, you'll see in the rest of the, uh, of the state. Um, as I said, it came to our, our, uh, our knowledge that we were using some federal assets. We absolutely have to do that. Um, to, to do this correctly. So the fix was, was to move all that federal, the stuff that was formerly done by federal um, folks and, and have it done by the state. And, or, or we contract to have it done is, is what this bill basically does. It's really, it, it's a, it's a self-funding. Um, we take the money that um, grazers pay for us in leases. And in turn, we, uh, we turn that back into, um, management so that, uh, that they can track where they are, that uh, we, our cow, calf uh, um, counts are correct, um, that they're moved around and we need um, training space. Um, somebody goes out there and notifies the grazer and gets that stuff out. So that'll all be a sort of a, its own program now run by the monies that, um, that are generated from the lease. So that's sort of the big picture um, discussion of, of why it was needed. If, if it fails to, to, to happen, I'm afraid that uh, we're, we're gonna be constrained and forced to, to probably not do grazing, which I really, really do not want to do to our neighbors or, um, or to, the, to, the, uh, to, the, to Camp Guernsey, because it, it is beneficial for fire mitigation. And one of my, my greatest fears is, is fires generated on Camp Guernsey that, that leak out from our training area and, uh, and spill over into our, our neighbors. Um, Terrible thing. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, that's sort of uh, I think the one over the world. Um, if uh, if if you have any questions, I'd be sure happy to to answer them. Or if you want to go right to the bill, sir, it's your pleasure. Questions for General Porter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, General Porter, uh, the money that's left over at the end of the year that goes back to the state. Yes, sir. That is, uh, Mr. Chairman. Please, uh, Representative Stiver. That is exactly right. It, uh, any any leftover dollars reverts to the general fund. Other questions?
No, go ahead. Take us through the bill quickly. All right, sir. I will uh, turn over this uh, this discussion to uh, to Chris Smith as he walks you through the bill, and I'll be right right next to him. Okay, that's an easy way to do it. Chris, good to see you again. <laughs> you as well, sir. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, I am Chris Smith, the general counsel now for the Wyoming Military Department, having worked on this issue in the interim. The bill in front of you, House Bill 17, essentially in Section 1, sir, if you want me just to go through the bill and highlight? Just quickly, please don't read the bill. Just no, absolutely not, sir. So really in Section 1, we create a new Section 19.7.209, which essentially creates the fund that General Porter just mentioned. The idea being that we believe in historically has been true that the military department returns hundreds of thousands of dollars to the general fund every biennium based on the lease payments. So we think that we can get around the prohibition of using federal employees or federally reimbursed state employees by having this self-administered fund. So in section one on pages one, two and three and on to page four, basically is the outline of creating this fund in a particular note on page two, line 10, it lists what the fund can be used for. And really, I just wanted to stress for the committee, it's to conduct the day-to-day day, day -day range management grazing operations, ensure the safety of our customers, arrange for uh, water storage and other facilities, fire breaks, uh, work the annual, annual animal usage, manage the leases, and whatever we need to do for cultural environmental assessments. So that's really what section one does. Um, of particular note, on page three down at the bottom, beginning on line 19, in order for the fund to start, there is there on page three at the bottom, $300,000 which goes into the fund to seed it, as I would call it, so that we can contract out or hire employees against that, that budget item with the idea that by the end of the biennium, uh, we would, it would be self-sustaining and that money would be returned. On page four, uh, on line five, the adjutant general, well, on, on line two, we would, promulgate rules as necessary to administer the program. On line five, the Adjutant General will report back to the Joint Transportation Highways and Military Affairs Committee regarding income and expenditures so the legislature would know where the money went. Section two on page four uh, is an authorization to hire up to three at-will contract employees. And, and Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, during the interim, we had long discussions about whether or not we could contract out for these services or we need to hire state employees. Given the current state budget issues with employees, we wanted to make sure that we would start anyway with at will employees in case this just doesn't work or if we contract out. And so that's what happens in section two on page four. And then you can see the appropriation of the $300,000 seed money. On page five, starting on line two, it shows that this really ends on June 30th of 22 in terms of the seed money. And we can't, can't use it for any other purpose and anything left over reverts as of June 30th of 22. Anything that occurs in the fund that is not used to manage the fund reverts to the general fund as has been our practice in past years. So that's the bill. Uh, section three makes it effective immediately since really uh, General Porter, uh, we have assumed some risk in the military department given the Secretary of Defense memo in June of 2020. We've kept grazing going, uh, even though the sec Secretary of Defense said, you know, shut it off, but we were, need to do an orderly shutdown. So we need the bill effective immediately so we can stand this up as quickly as possible. With that, sir, uh, I have a lot of facts that we went over during the interim but I will wait on the committee's pleasure. And that is the bill, sir. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Uh, any questions for Mr. Smith? Any questions? Okay, thank you. Don't, don't run off. You might as well 
or you and you and General Porter both. Okay. Um, yes, Carla, do we have anyone in the waiting room who wishes to, to speak on this bill? I don't see anybody that has raised their hands, um, but I guess I, I'll ask if they, uh, if they wanna speak, if they would raise their little hand um, uh, symbol down at the bottom of their Zoom um, stream. Thank you, Chairman Burkhart. I don't see anything. Okay. Uh, if nobody wishes to testify, then I will uh, close testimony on the public testimony on this bill. Okay. So, members of the committee, what's your pleasure? Move the bill. Second. Moved by Henderson, seconded by Brown. And Carl, I'll try to go slow. I know you're taking notes. And, and uh, any comments on the bill? Representative Stiver. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have one amendment to change that date from June 30th, 2022 to June 30th, 2024 to give them more time to get this set up and working right. Is that an, is that an amendment? That is a motion for an amendment. Okay, is there a second? Second? Representative Burt, was that a, a second? Yeah, you're muted. Yes, sir, that was a second to, to the amendment. Okay, so discussion on the amendment, uh, your logic, reasoning? Uh, Just Representative Brown. Representative Stiver, go ahead. Well, uh, this is already 2021. That's not enough time for them to get this set up and working right. Uh, 2024 is the end of the uh, end of the second biennium. And I think that's enough time for them to get it working. If they're going to hire the employees, get the rules promulgated, and this working correctly. I don't know how the military works. Yep. Representative Brown. Mr. Chairman, I appreciate that. Uh, I would just, I would actually ask uh, General Porter, as, after hearing this during the interim, there was no real concern about that. It seemed like they pretty much had everything ready to go. Um, I, I do typically kind of worry about having um, bills cross, if, if this is going to turn into a session law, uh, crossing bienniums uh, and obligations for the next biennium. So I would ask uh, the general if if he needs that time, uh, I would be supportive of it. If it's not needed, I would say, let's keep it where it's at and kind of get this money expended and get this contract underway. Yeah, general Porter, can you address that, please? Yes, Mr. Chairman, you know, I appreciate the ability to uh, to to extend it out a little bit. I and, and it would be helpful, but I don't think it's a showstopper. And I think we could uh, to sh I think we could show um, at least some indication of, of uh, the ability for us to, to make sure this is working in the timeline currently in the bill. OK. Representative Henderson, did you have a comment? You just muted yourself. Sorry, I was going to call okay. the question, Chairman. That's all I was going to do. All right. I think I think Representative Stiver had another comment. Okay. No. Okay. All right. Any other comments on the amendment? Okay. Show of hands. All in favor of the amendment? Raise your hand so that can be seen, please. One, two. All opposed. One, two, three, four, five, six. Amendment fails. Okay. So, any other amendments on the bill? Question on the bill, Mr. Chairman. Okay. And I am assuming you don't need to go through it page by page this time. Okay. Question having been called. Carla, would you take the roll, please? Or Rihanna, whoever's taking roll. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll take the roll. Um, Representative Baker. Aye. Carla? Yes. So, so it is a, a motion to do pass. Oh, motion to do pass. And Representative Baker said yes. Uh, Representative Brown. 
Aye. Representative Burt. Aye. Representative Henderson. Aye. Representative Obermuller. Aye. Representative O'Hearn. Aye. Representative Stigar. Aye. Vice Chair McGuire. Aye. And Chairman Burkhardt. Aye. Pass unanimously, do pass. Thank you. So Representative Stiver, you're still up for floor managing the bill? Okay, thank you. Give me a moment to make a few notes. Okay, next bill for our consideration is House Joint Resolution 1, Traumatic Brain Injury and Post-Traumatic Stress Treatments. Uh, so let's see, Chris, uh, will it be you or will it be General Porter to explain this to us? Uh, Mr. Chairman, it'll be, be me, but General Porter is ready, willing, and able to pitch in. <laughs> okay, all right. Mr. Smith, please. Thank Proceed. you, sir. So this joint resolution came out of the interim of the Joint Transportation Committee. And really it was brought, up, brought to the attention of the committee from um, a couple of different sources, including Senator Steinmetz. Essentially, there has been some research that has shown that hyperbaric oxygen treatment has helped with closed head traumatic brain injuries, TBIs as we call them. And the VA has been, as is often the case with, with government entities, has been slow to adopt some of these additional treatment options. During the interim, there was a great deal of testimony from several sources of folks involved in this kind of treatment, especially down at a clinic down in Colorado, where it has shown to help our veterans and our military members with TBI injuries. The result of that was the drafting of the resolution in front of the committee today, House Joint Resolution 0001. What this essentially does, sir, if I can turn towards the, to the resolution, is it essentially asks the VA to consider these treatment options. In the whereas clauses on page one and two, you can see some, some very detailed um, reasons for doing this, one of which being uh, that TBIs and the inability to treat some of these uh, head injuries are indicated to have a factor in the up to 22 veteran suicides the nation is experiencing every day. Um, so that was one of the, one of the highlights uh, for many of us as to why we need the VA to consider all treatment options. And I won't, you can go through on page one, two, and into three, the, where, the various whereas is essentially asking the VA to consider these treatment options and any other. In section one, uh, towards the bottom of page three, you can see where the legislature is requesting Congress to enact legis legislation to give veterans access to TBI and post-traumatic stress disorder with this hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So really, sir, and, and then on, on page four, section two, uh, it essentially directs the Secretary of State to transmit the resolution to the congressional delegation of Wyoming and really the Secretary of the VA. So sir, with that, uh, that is really what the resolution does. It, it basically asks the VA and Congress to do everything they can for our veterans. Uh, particularly since this particular treatment has shown some promise in helping our veterans who deal with post-traumatic stress disorder and the accompany often uh, TBI, traumatic brain injuries. With that, sir, I'll stand for the committee's questions. Any questions for Mr. Smith? Any questions? Okay. Representative Obermuller, did you have a question? Okay, uh, Mr. Smith, just I, I have one for you. I'm 
a little familiar with uh, the hyperbaric treatment for traumatic brain injuries, but the portion about post-traumatic stress disorder, um, just a little bit of information on that, please. Um, I wasn't aware that, that this treatment would work for uh, that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, during the interim, and, and of course, as a lawyer, I'm, I'm by no means a medical expert, but we had two people, uh, and I can't remember their names, that was at the May of 2020 uh, hearing that testified that in their clinic down in Colorado, as they treat various veterans with uh, TBI and P PTSD, they have used this particular hyperbaric treatment to help both categories of people. And there is a lot of overlap, as you may imagine. Uh, most people with TBIs have gone through a PTSD problem. And, and those, I'll say experts, counselors, I think they were uh, essentially testified before this, this committee in the interim that they've shown promise that a number of people who had PTSD, who went through a hyperbaric uh, oxygen treatment, got some resolution to some of the symptoms with PTSD. It's not a cure-all, it's not for every PTSD person. In fact, I remember one of the, the counselors suggesting that maybe there was some undiagnosed uh, TBI in some of the PTSD patients they had, which is why some of them reacted so well to the oxygen treatment. But that's all I can say, sir. Certainly we can dig up some more information from those counselors. All right. Any other? Representative Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, just like some information to bring it home to Wyoming. How's this, how's this affecting our veterans in Wyoming, Colonel? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Please. Representative Henderson. Uh, we, we have a number of veterans in Wyoming. I don't have the numbers in front of me um, who suffer from TBIs. We've had a number of people in the uh, transition program down at Fort Carson coming off of their deployment who have experienced TBI injuries most recently in the Army National Guard. So I can't tell you it affects hundreds of veterans in Wyoming but it definitely affects dozens based on our limited cross-section that I'm aware of in the Army National Guard in their recent deployment. Okay. Other questions for Mr. Smith? Other questions? Okay. Uh, with that, I'll open it up to public testimony. Uh, Carla, is there anyone waiting to speak? No, Mr. Chairman, I do not see anybody with their hand raised. Okay, thank you. Uh, with that, then I'll close public testimony. Uh, committee, what is your pleasure? Move the bill, Mr. Chairman. Uh, moved by Brown, seconded by Stiver. Okay. All right. Uh, let's see, I think, I think it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the reasoning, everything else. Uh, let's do this one a little different. We'll just do this as we normally would. Uh, anything on page one? Page two? Page three? Page four? Okay. All right. Committee? Question. Question having been called. Carla, would you please call the roll? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, motion on due pass for jo House Joint Bill 001, um, moved by Representative Brown, seconded by Representative Stivar. Um, Representative Baker. Aye. Representative Brown. Aye. Representative Burt? Aye. Representative Henderson? Aye. Representative Obermuller? Aye. Representative O'Hearn? Aye. Representative Stivar? Aye. Representative McGuire? Aye. And Chairman Burkhardt? Aye. 
And Representative Burt, are you still up for floor managing this? Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, with that, uh, the next bill for our consideration is uh, military training memorials. And I'll ask Representative McGuire uh, to walk us through this, explain the bill, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Would you like me to read the bill to you? Please do not. Just no. Okay. Uh, to summarize the bill, this is uh, a bill to honor our military members. And uh, the first portion of it, uh, section one, the Wyoming Department of Transportation will be, uh, they will have uh, control of where these uh, memorials or interpretive signs are raised. And they will be built or uh, installed in accordance with YDOT's engineering and requirements. And it's to be done in cooperation or in partnership with non-governmental organizations. And what we, the anticipation is with that, for example, uh, the Friends of the Wyoming Department, or excuse me, the Friends of the Wyoming Veterans Museum uh, are working towards putting up one of these memorials or interpretive signs. We're also hoping to encourage other uh, groups and organizations, for example, Eagle Scouts, uh, some grade schools, or small um, groups of um, organizations in small towns. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the final location and the final wording and everything will need to be approved by the uh, Adjutant General of the Wyoming National Guard, and that is on the top of page number uh, two. At this time, the request is to set aside up to $20,000 of previously appropriated state funds that have not been spent. Now that doesn't mean that there will be 20,000. It would be if there are unappropriated funds, then up to that amount would be earmarked for the purpose of these memorials. Uh, the match is right now, the match is a one to three. So one part the uh, private entities, three parts, the uh, Wyoming Department of Transportation. The reason that we have left the match in that ratio is again, we are hoping that these small municipal groups, for example, there is a, uh, a site in Edgerton, Wyoming, which would be ideal for one of these interpretive signs. Uh, the group that is in Edgerton, the entire group can meet around one table in the coffee shop. So uh, we don't want to make it so that financially these interpretive signs are out of reach for small groups or Boy Scout troops. Uh, so that's why we've left the match at a one to three. Doesn't mean that the private entities couldn't put forward much more than that. Also, we anticipate that there'll be in-kind contributions. And uh, at the appropriate time, Mr. Chairman, I think that we do have a guest who is a, uh, an individual that would speak towards this. And at that point, I'd like to introduce him at your pleasure. Thank you. Any questions for Representative Clark? Representative Clark, do you have a question? Yeah, yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm a no vote on this. I don't think we need to be spending money on military training accidents. Being military myself, uh, the training accidents. Uh, I believe the last uh, person trying to die in a military training accident in Wyoming was a troop out of uh, Sheridan who was killed in a five-ton accident. There is a plaque already on the side of the inter uh, I-25 I for him. Uh, with the budget the way it is, I am a no vote on this. So anyone, any other questions for Representative Barr? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative McGuire, you stated in the in the bill and, and in previous conversations uh, to the committee that this is up to twenty thousand dollars of previously other uh, appropriated other state funds. Can you explain to the committee, uh, especially for some of the newer members here, the difference between other state funds and? Uh, whether or not this is coming out of general funds, uh, what 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 this is actually entailing here. I think that might be beneficial uh, because the language does matter. Representative Guar. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So yes, 
The Wyoming Department of Transportation is not a general fund department. It, uh, the funds that come to YDOT come through federal and state uh, fuel taxes. And so as these taxes are returned to the state of Wyoming, YDOT creates a budget and they will spend up to, sometimes they don't spend all of their budget depending on how contracts and weather and other things go. So at the end of the year, there's always a small true up. Sometimes there's an excess, sometimes there's not. And so the anticipation of this bill is if there's an excess and if those funds are not earmarked for anything else, then they would be available for the um, for copay with regard to these military memorials. Okay. Other questions for Representative McGuire? Anyone else? Okay. Uh, Representative McGuire, I, I do have one. Looking at the bill, um, and you're taking the funds out of the, the session laws um, from 2020. Uh, does that mean that then this is non-codified uh, bill, non-codified law, and it goes away uh, at the end of the, the budget biennium? Uh, I would anticipate that that's correct. However, um, it kind of depends on how the bill ends up in its final form. And that's sort of the question for LSL and, and uh, the statute publishers. Okay. Any other questions for Representative McGuire? Uh, Carla, I think we do have someone on this one uh, in the waiting room. Uh, if you would admit them, and I'll, I'll let Representative introduce them. Um, yes, that would be, I'm not seeing anybody with their hand up. Oh, here, I, I do now. Okay, thank you. We'll just take our time. This is a new process. There we go. Director Reiner, you're on or, or okay, I, I assumed, I thought we were having someone different. Just give me a minute. Is that correct, Representative McGuire? Yeah, I was, was it was it uh, Director Reiner? I was hoping it would be Mark Milliken. Is he uh, in the waiting area? Yes, yes, gentlemen, he is. I can promote him. Okay, and uh, when I finish uh, with my introduction, uh, Mr. Milliken, uh, be sure to unmute your microphone. I'd like to introduce a truly an outstanding individual, Mark Milliken. He is a Wyoming professional geologist. He's the owner and principal geologist of Tri Triangle G Consulting in Casper, uh, 47 years in engineering and petroleum geology with a BS and MS in geology. He's a Vietnam era veteran, married with a son and granddaughter. He's a volunteer with the Wyoming Veterans Memorial Museum, as well as a board member, the Friends of the Wyoming Veterans Memorial Museum, past president of the Wyoming Geological Association, and a volunteer with the Colorado Aviation Society. Uh, he's got a very compelling story to tell, and, and I would just like to also add, uh, at this point, the military, excuse me, the Friends of the Wyoming Military Museum have been engaged in restoring the original fire truck, the 1942 fire truck from the Casper Army Air Base. And uh, Mr. Milliken and his volunteers really put that on and have taken control of it. And it's one of those things where when asked, they would say, if anybody knew how bad that truck was, they wouldn't have started on it, but they did. And what was originally just get it up and running so that we could use it and display it has turned into a completely frame off restoration. And Mr. Milliken has been involved in raising funds, uh, asking for volunteer work, getting uh, uh, things donated, scrounging. And the truck is just about ready uh, for full display. It, uh, it's up and running, and they just have to finish the tank and a couple of other things, and it'll be good to go. And uh, I just would like to say thank you. Again, he's just an outstanding individual and somebody that. We're so proud to have associated with the museum and associated with the state of Wyoming. So thank you. Go ahead, Mr. Melkin. Mr. Melkin, please. Okay. Can anybody hear me? Yeah, can hear you. 
I'm trying to get my, this is a little different than what Joe and I practiced last night. So <clears throat> I'm trying to get my presentation up on the screen. And can anybody see that? Yes. Okay, Carla, with your permission, what I'd like to do is go through, is go through this. Uh, it's it's going to take a very short amount of time. Uh, I'm not very long winded on this. And I just want to thank Joe for helping us out. Uh, I've been with the Wyoming Veterans Memorial Museum since uh, 2000 uh, with Joy Kading there. And uh, we uh, started the process out there by which Eagle Scouts can volunteer their time there at the museum. And since then, it's been a very successful program. I'm also uh, involved with the Experimental Aircraft Association. They've been very helpful in uh, some of these aircraft accident sites that we've been finding. Also the Colorado Aviation Historical Society, they're, they're very helpful. And so what I'd like to do is just go through real quick what some of the success that we've had with these uh, lost airmen and uh, some of the challenges we have and maybe underscore the importance perhaps of, of uh, putting some of these monuments on the side of the highways. I think uh, we see a lot of monuments with regards to, say, wildlife and such. Well, these, these military uh, uh, air crew that were lost in these accidents, this is a terrific human interest story. And anyone driving by, <clears throat> anyone driving by these things is going to be immediately attracted to a human interest story on the board. And uh, I think Joe has a good idea here, and I think it's going to be very popular uh, with the traveling public. Okay. So, please proceed. Okay, so, in of course, in Wyoming, there was a, there were a lot of uh, there were a lot of air crew uh, trained in Wyoming. But overall, in the whole United States during World War II, almost one third of all of the air crew losses were due to stateside training. Almost fifteen thousand. And of course, here in Wyoming with Casper Army Air Base training uh, combat crews for overseas deployment, we had more than our fair share of accidents and, uh, and uh, fatalities. And so this has been the, the museum's focus for the last few years is trying to find these sites and document them. Casper Army Air Base is, uh, of course, was active from 42 to 45. There were 18,000 air crew that went through uh, the base. At its maximum, the, uh, uh, the base had 6,000 uh, uh, 6, people. This was about the population of Casper. Uh, over, over this time period, there were 90 training accidents and 136 fatalities. It's these fatalities that we want to try to recognize and bring to the attention of the public. And here's a, I want to get too involved in statistics, but you can see here in 1944, that was the highest uh, fatality rate for the year. We had 79 uh, lost air crew and 50 crashes. So this is a proposal to prepare some signs similar to the one uh, in the corner there, wildlife sign, and uh, to honor these men who, who lost their lives. And in fact, uh, there was one woman who lost her life. In a, it wasn't a training accident, but it was a, a military aircraft accident here in Casper. And at some point, maybe uh, this year, we we're gonna start working on that project to honor her and, and the men who died with her in that aircraft near Casper here. But for now, I'm going to talk about some of the uh, some of the crash sites that we've been working with here recently. There are three of them that Joe brought up uh, that he wanted me to address. The uh, Shirley Rim rest area where we'd be looking at a sign there that would that would uh, uh, bring to uh, the traveling public's attention the Murchison crew, which is Don Murchison out of Casper Army Air Base. And that was a B-24 that crashed in 1945, lost six men. 
And then the second one is Edgerton, and that's the Donald Trail crew of the B-24, and there were two men lost in that. Bomber Mountain is another crew, uh, the Ronigan crew from B, it was the B-17. That particular B-17 was from, uh, actually from Mountain Home. I'm not going to spend much time on it because I haven't worked it, but these other two Wyoming crews are of great interest. The Shirley Rim Rest Area will have the Murchison crew, and, and of course, the uh, wreck site is about 10 miles uh, northeast of the rest area. It's on private land, and just last year, we discovered the site with the help of the EAA, Experimental Aircraft Association, and with the Colorado group, and uh, just last year, we discovered it, and it has been lost for 75 years, and finally, we've... Uh, brought closure to that wreck site. And it's one of the few bomber sites in the Rocky Mountains that was not, that was never, that was lost for all these years. Part of the problem was, was the Army Air Force report was so poor and the descriptions of the locations were uh, just totally unusable. And uh, so it required a lot of uh, investigative work. The Edgerton crew, the Edgerton is Donald Trail Donald Trail was a um, combat veteran in Italy, I think 15th Air Force with B-24s. And he had something like 35 combat missions uh, from Italy into Europe. He came back to the United States and of all things, they asked him to, to train, uh, they train crews and he said he would. So he came out here to Casper and was training combat crews here at Casper and uh, he was on a he was on a training mission uh, from Casper, I think, to Nebraska, when they developed engine problems over uh, Edgerton, and and the crew most of the crew bailed out, but Donald the the, the pilot uh, Trail uh, did not want to crash the plane into the town of Edgerton, so he and the co-pilot stayed with it, flew it over the town, got it out of the way of the population. They bailed out at the last second, but they were too low and they were killed. And uh, the, the town of uh, Edgerton is still, still talks about that. It's, it's a very important, uh, that was an important aspect to their history up there. The Bomber Mountain was uh, up near, uh, that's up just north of Ten Sleep Lake. And one of the things we were talking about maybe was some, doing something with the veterans home in Buffalo. Again, this is something I have not done any work with. I'm just bringing it to your attention as, a, as another option here in, your, in, in Wyoming. This is the Murchison aircraft. This is the real deal. Uh, six crewmen were lost. They were on a mission to uh, Nebraska and they came back on the January 1st, 1945. And they came back and late at night, they lost their way. Uh, they were one of eight aircraft, seven of which had to land because of bad weather. And this particular B-24 here, uh, they, they went to the south, uh, quite a bit, quite a bit to the south of Casper. And they were just, and they were on a northern heading towards Casper. And we think that they probably thought they were north of Casper Mountain and they were descending into the Casper area. So everything was good, everything was fine. They had all four engines running, they had good airspeed, and they just literally flew into the ground. They flew into a flat area and the airplane slid for about 1300 feet in the snow. And the uh, airplane uh, then wound up down in Bates Creek where it was crushed. In talking to the ranchers out there, they, they went out there at, right after the accident and they actually found the crew, mem crew members uh, evidence that the crew members had tried to survive in part of the airplane, but they all froze to death before they could be rescued. We are um, right now working with descendants of the Murchison crew, and we've got at least two families who have responded. And next summer, we're going to have a, next summer, let me see, let me go back up. Next summer, we're gonna have a, uh, a memorial service out there. Uh, we're going to put a plaque in the ground, and maybe Joe mentioned that we had a plaque that was paid for with private funds, and thanks to Joe uh, getting the word out for that, we had uh, several hundred dollars donated. There was more than enough to buy the plaque. 
this is what this is what we're talking about on these crash sites. You can see here that the wreckage is very small, so you can and it's and it's and it's widely scattered among the sagebrush. This is again the Murchison site. The uh, the wreckage is so scattered that it's no wonder that this site remained unknown for 75 years until last summer when we found it. This is the actual site where the fuselage of the airplane ended up. And we left a little flag, a little memorial out there last summer for him because this would be where probably most of the crew uh, would have perished is be this spot right here. It's a beautiful spot out in Bates Creek. It's about 20 miles south of Casper. This is just fabulous spot here. And we, it just brings tears to our eyes, those of us who investigate these sites. So yeah, it's, it's very, uh, it's a tearjerker doing this stuff. This is the plaque that we had made for the crew. And uh, like I say, we've been in contact with some of the descendants of this crew and there's ways you can do it. There's Facebook, there's find a grave and, and go to local newspapers. And uh, so we're, we're having some good luck and we hope to have these people out. We hope to have these descendants out there along with a, maybe a, uh, some other with some other uh, aspects of uh, uh, military uh, with paying respect to these military men out there we're, this is still in the making right now but right now it's scheduled for July 24th this is the Edgerton site and uh, with Edgerton in the background town of Edgerton in the background there this site here the airplane actually was flying over uh, Salt Creek oil field when uh, they developed their engine trouble and uh, the crew, most of the crew was ordered to bail out. And some of them, back in 1944, Salt Creek oil field was totally covered with steel derricks. It was a forest of steel derricks. Most of the crew bailed out, uh, but it was not, it was not a, uh, it was not an easy thing to do when you're parachuting down into a bunch of oil derricks, but they did it. And uh, in the background is, Edgerton, and like I said, the, the pilot and co-pilot stayed with the plane uh, until they flew over Edgerton, and they got out of they got out of the way of Edgerton, and then they bailed out just between here and Edgerton, where the scene is. And then the airplane continued by itself, and it crashed into this knoll here, where we are right now with this picture. This is from last summer. This is one of the things we found at Ed Edgerton. This is a propeller hub. And uh, there's an awful lot of parts out there. And we still need to go in and, and document the parts, GPS the parts. But these are, these are just a couple sites that we're, we're doing work on right now, like archaeological work, actually. Uh, so we're not archaeologists, but we are aeroarchaeologists. So we're, we're kind of uh, amateur in that regard. But it, it's, it's interesting work, and we're doing a very good job. And the main thing we try to do is respect the land because these parts belong to whoever owns the land. So it's, it's, you have to respect the land, whether it's private or federal or state. And that's all I have for right now. Does anybody have any questions? Any questions for Mr. Milliken? And could we get out of the sharing screen mode? I Because I can only see like three people on the small screens that I have. So if we could... Do that, please. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Okay. Any questions for Mr. Milliken? Anyone? Okay, Mr. Milliken, thank you very much. Very interesting. Uh, good luck in, in you know, your research on these accidents and, and that. And uh, I know they're around. And they're probably thank you. yeah thank you very much for your attention and uh i i hope that we can succeed with this and i thank joe again for his hard work on all of this and i uh, look forward to working with him for another year okay great i think with that uh director reiner um i think you're up next yeah, thank you uh Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, for the record, uh, uh, Luke Reiner, Director Wydot. Uh, and, and thank you for the ability to, to, to comment uh, on this bill. And let me, let me just start by saying, 
you know, where, where you sit uh, certainly matters. And, and I absolutely support this concept uh, of, of recognizing uh, military members and, and thank the bringer, you know, of this bill, you know, for his passion in, in this subject. And thank Mark Milliken for, for his, his hard work and sharing of those stories. Here's, here's what I would say is that uh, YDOT is happy to work with anybody about appropriate memorials uh, along our highways. And that really we already have the authority to do so. Um, in fact, we're working signs for various agencies um, as we speak. And we don't think that takes legislation. Um, when we're approached uh, for signs or memorials, what we typically always do is ask that whoever approaches us brings the appropriate funding. And that's really in accordance with the guiding principles that I've been directed uh, to implement and to follow by the Transportation Commission. And that has clearly spelled out where we need to spend our transportation dollars uh, in this state. Um, an example of people bringing their own money would be, you know, really we dedicated uh, the Leonard Robinson Bridge, again, which was a phenomenal tribute to a phenomenal man. Again, many of you were involved in that, but, but the $5,000 that came from those signs did not come from transportation funding. So uh, initially I'd say uh, to get a memorial up, I'm not sure it takes legislation. In fact, we think we can do it without. Uh, that being said, uh, in the case of this specific bill, if it is the legislator's desire to have a piece of legislation or, and have a bill, a couple of comments. Um, on page two, uh, line one to four, it talks about the duties of the adjutant general to uh, finalize and approve the design and the location. Well, I'm, I'm happy to uh, let the adjutant general uh, approve the design. I think that the location is, is a wide eyed issue. Roads and right of ways, I, I believe belong to, to us and would, would recommend uh, that that be changed uh, for a couple of reasons. One is safety, two is, you know, depending on where you put a, a sign or memorial, it may take turnouts that adds to the cost and certainly, I, I think I think everybody's goal here is is reduction in cost. In in section two, um, I, I guess I guess here's here's my comment on on transportation funding. Um, and as the Transportation and Military Affairs Committee, you're all aware of the funding gap, the significant funding gap that your white out faces. In fact, in the last uh, meeting. Uh, before the changeover, many of you attended uh, the consultant that we hired really to give me an idea of where we sit in terms of gap. Said, hey, $354 million a year, wide out all funding gap. In fact, you're all well aware that there's three funding bills up uh, for transportation funding uh, this year. So it, it, knowing that the financial stress we're under, it, it, it is very awkward uh, for me and, and really uh, for the Transportation Commission, uh, if we were to fund this. For, for example, you know, we've, we've shut down rest areas across this state and, and it's awkward. Uh, it would be awkward for us to fund military memorials and not have rest areas open. And I, I think that would be a red flag uh, to, to our, our, our public. And so my suggestion on the funding, if, if this goes to legislation, is that the appropriate non-governmental organization as referred to in section one would be responsible for the funding of these memorials. And, and I would also uh, respectively recommend that you add verbiage in section two that talks about who must maintain the memorial in the future. Uh, we have run into instances where we've had memorials that fall down and, and, and at White Out, we're probably not thinking that's our job to resurrect them, but people have sort of thought that was our job. And, and so now as we enter in, we enter into long-term memorandums of understanding about who was responsible for funding of what. 
and and it, it's you, you know you know I spent 36 years in the military, and it's not an issue of not wanting to 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 honor our military members. Uh, today I'm speaking to you as the YDOT director responsible for transportation funds in the state of Wyoming. Uh, and Mr. Chairman, that, that would be uh, my comments on, on the bill, pending any questions or comments that you might have. Th thank you, Director Reiner. Any questions for the director? Questions for the director? D director, I have, then if no one else does, I have a, a couple. So um, what what's the, the sign that was shown on the slides, what approximately is the cost of one of those signs? Uh, Mr. Chairman, if you're talking about the watching, you're talking about the watching wildlife sign? Yes, Director, the, the large, I, I guess they're cast aluminum or something like that, uh, that are hung out there. What, approximately the cost of one of those and, and to install it, I'm just curious. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I, I do not know that off the top of my head. Uh, with your permission, uh, Mr. Mark Gillette is on. I don't know if he knows the cost of those signs, but but if he does, I'd ask him to raise his hand and answer. Otherwise, Mr. Chairman, I'm gonna owe you a do out on that one. Okay. Uh, Carla, does, does someone have their hand up that can answer that? Mr. Chairman, I'm not seeing a hand is okay. yeah mr mr chairman i just got i just got a, a note from mr gillette he does not know the cost so i'm going to ask the guys to research it if we're still online while we're talking about this bill we'll, we'll come back okay thank you and and then my next question is right now uh what do you see as the potential for uh let's say leftover money out of the department of transportation uh, mr chairman uh, realistically there's zero percent of leftover uh, money. All money that we have is dedicated transportation. In fact, in fact, you saw the report of the shortage. And, and so um, money rolls from year to year from project to project. And um, the, the other, the other uh, you know, note is, is here, most of our money, uh, the, the money that comes from fuel tax and from registration uh, could not be spent on this because it doesn't directly affect uh, the transportation infrastructure that, that we support or those items that support it. There is some other, there is some other state money really in, that, that we do receive um, that would be the only type of money that could be used. But again, Mr. Chairman, it is, it is well spec spoken for and is, is decided to engage in other in transportation related projects. Okay. So director of the money, would this money be able to come out of the 1% beautification set aside. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, that's a that's a good question. And again, I'll ask uh, Mr. Gillette uh, if, if it can. I, to the best of my knowledge, beautification is specifically assigned to uh, specific projects. But let me let me see if Mr. Gillette can help me on that one. Carla, could you admit uh, Mr. Gillette, please? Um, Chairman Burkhart, he doesn't appear to be on the list of attendees. Okay, all right, that's that's fine. That's that's fine. Right. Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I just did get a note from Mr. Gillette, um, and he does not know, and we'll have to quickly research that. Okay, that's, that's right. a good question. So, so from what you said, you don't feel that you kind of need a bill or need direction from the legislature to. Uh, put up the, these memorials and that, but you do need something to direct money, in other words, am I correct? Mr. Chairman, our, our policy within YDOT is that if somebody comes to us and wants to put something up uh, along the road or in our right of way or in one of our rest areas, is that is that they they, they pay to do so. And, and that that's how we work it. We will often help them with the installation um, because it, it is good for the state of Wyoming to put these up. And I certainly would advocate putting up these signs. Um, and, and, and we would likely install those, um, but the cost of the sign itself, we, we feel that the, the bringer should, should, should bring the fiscal resources to do that. Okay, great. 
uh, Representative O'Hearn. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Are the, uh, Mr. Director, are they, what's the maintenance? Is there an MOI on the ones that you've installed already for who takes care of those um, signs and placards now? Mr. Chairman? Director, please. And Representative Hearn, um, the way that the MOU works now is, and specifically it's been on our, on our, um, the big signs that you see out along the road, the, the gray, the, the brown signs with, with white or yellow lettering, those will, um, those fade away after 15 years. And so we'll ask whoever wants to put up the signs to commit to funding the replacement of those signs because because we won't replace them after 15 years. And if they're up, they need to look professional. Uh, otherwise, otherwise they shouldn't be up. In terms of these these smaller signs in the rest areas, hey, we'll mow, we'll mow around them. Um, I mean, at the rest area, we have to mow it anywhere. So we'll we'll mow around them. And so that type of maintenance would 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 take care of. But if it needs to be cleaned, um, uh, you know, polished and those type of items, we'd ask uh, those, those, those type of issues to be taken care of uh, by the, by the install. Okay, thank you. Representative Henderson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Director, it's good to see you. And thank you for, for your comments. Uh, so my question is related to, you know, all the signs that we have across the state already that are transportation related. I mean, is there no room in, in that in that budget? I mean, you send a truck out along a road to maintain signs, they couldn't uh, take the opportunity to uh, check these out, mow around, make sure they're okay. Would that be, I mean, would the, would the cost of these type of signs be be that, uh, that much to maintain them? Director? Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Henderson, so really in, in, the, in the case of this specific example, we were looking at putting uh, the sign at, the, at a rest area. And so, so it'll be maintained, uh, we'll maintain it as part of the rest area. But I think the maintenance becomes, you know, um, birds may sit on top of it and, and, and leave a mess. Um, they, they fade in time and need to be cleaned and polished. Um, they need to be replaced at some point in time. And so that's, that's the long, that's the long-term maintenance we're talking about is, Hey, how do we ensure that the signs that we put up in, in, you know, in all of our right-of-ways along the roads that all of us drive on, uh, keep and maintain the image that we all expect of, of, of what's alongside of our road sign. And, and it's just, while, while I'd love to say to you, we'll do it with respect, we are not staffed and manned uh, to do that. And, and it is, it is, it is, it is, it's not something that, that I think we should take on. Thank you, director. Other questions for the director? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, uh, one Mr. comment here. I did receive a, a note back um, that uh, says about five thousand dollars for uh, for one of those uh, signs that you talked about. Thank you, Director. Dire Director, uh, just curious, um, and if you don't know the answer, that's fine. Don't don't go doing a lot of work to look it up. What's your budget say annually for all the signs you put up and have to replace and repair and maintain? Um, Mr. Chairman, you're right. I don't have that at the top of my head, but uh, but my my finance guys are watching, and so again, depending on how long this takes, I I, I probably can have an answer for you. Um, but it it is it is it is significant. I, I would mention, uh, Mr. Chairman, you know that the signs that we talk about that we make in our sign shop are not like the signs that was um, depicted by Mr. Milliken on, on the on the, the completely different different animal. Okay. Um, I, I would also add that typically on the existing um, signs like we're talking about, we'll, we'll typically, if they need some maintenance, you know, beyond what we can do, we'll typically call the owner and see if they can't come out and maintain them. Because, okay. yeah. All right. Thank you. Um, any other questions for the director? Okay. All right. 
Is there any other public comment? Can I add one more thing? This is uh, Mark Milliken. Yes, Mr. Milliken, proceed. We were talking about maintenance out there, and I, I don't know how hard it is to get volunteers to go out and restore a wildlife uh, sign. But if you've got a sign out there that is that is saluting uh, fallen heroes uh, here in Wyoming, there's not going to be any shortage of uh, volunteer labor to manage these signs. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. That, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just uh, uh, before we go on, uh, did Representative Stiver drop off or what happened to him? Carla, do you know? Mr. Chairman, this is Rihanna with LSO, and it doesn't appear that he's in the meeting, so we can we can try to get him back on. Okay. Go ahead, please. And and Representative Baker, are you able to be on or are you off or okay? I can see you. That's good. Mr. Chairman, my video, I don't know what's going on, but it's buffering and it's it's I'm lagging what seems like about 30 seconds, but Okay, just just stay on if you can, because, uh, and again, just a reminder, uh, mostly for the audience, if a member of the committee is not visible, uh, they are considered to not be participating. So, uh, Carla, anyone else uh, waiting to speak on the bill? Any other public testimony? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do not see any hands raised at this point. Okay, thank you. Uh, with that, then, I will close public testimony. Uh, committee? Move the bill. Moved by Mark. Thank you. By Henderson. Okay, discussion? Representative Obermuller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, when you look at page two, uh, line seven, uh, that deals with the $20,000 that this bill is about. And um, it, in listening to Director Reiner, it sounds like that $20,000 is very improbable in terms of coming to fruition. And his further testimony was without that funding, uh, what's the point of the bill? So. Uh, at this point, I would like that nexus of that money and the point of the bill to be uh, explained to me. Thank you. Okay. Representative McGuire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, with regard to that, I'd like to uh, just say thank you to General Reiner for his testimony. Uh, if anybody, I certainly respect his opinion uh, above and beyond anyone. So, with regard to the uh, money that uh, is not available at this time, there's no argument about that. And But I would still like to be able to uh, keep the frame of the bill insofar as the uh, initial uh, approval by the Wyoming Department of Transportation and the approval of the Adjutant General's Office because I, I think that it's important to have some framework if a group does come to the state. Um, and with regard to the funding, at the appropriate time, I would offer an amendment to change that to 50-50. And again, it's all dependent on whether or not there are funds. And if there are no funds, then if a group wants to come forward, they're going to have to come forward with the appropriate amount which uh, testimony shows is going to be about $5,000. And uh, at the appropriate time, I would offer an amendment to include with that a memorandum of understanding so that the group that's bringing it forward uh, does have responsibility for maintaining the sign moving into the future because uh, I certainly can't argue with uh, the director that that's an important aspect of this uh, project if it's to move forward. Okay. Any other comments? Representative O'Hearn. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Did that include uh, Representative McGuire? The um, what uh, Director Reiner also said about him de deciding the location of the um, monument. Representative McGuire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, uh, the first page it says that um, the Wyoming Department of Transportation, in cooperation with the non-government organization, may design and create. So there's no shall in here. It, certainly YDOT has got all, they have complete discretion as to where it would be located and what it would look like. And the second paragraph is uh, meant to be the adjutant general would have approval of the design and or what's on it. So uh, you know, whether or not that needs to be wordsmithed, I think that it is appropriate the way that it is. Again, YDOT has complete discretion and complete authority. So it's not, the group can't come and say, well, we want it in the uh, right of way or we want it here or we want it there. It, uh, it's in, co in cooperation with YDOT. And again, the operative word is may. So I think that that part is okay. Any other comments, Representative Burke? Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just, just for some clarification, um, is is the amendment to uh, you know switch the the funding ratio from the three to one to fifty fifty? Um, is that what the amendment is? Uh, Representative, we I don't think we've gotten to an amend oh, amendment I, yet. Just hang on for a minute. Sorry about that. I thought I thought that's right. I apologize. Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I, uh, I think I'm going to speak uh, both on myself and on behalf of uh, uh, Representative Stivar. We both have similar issues here related to this, and and I voiced my concerns during the interim. So um, please, please bear with me on this. But um, I think we have uh, a, a situation here where we're looking at spending any type of money of state money on these plaques as opposed to roads. Um, we, we have a funding shortfall in NOIDOT, we have a funding shortfall everywhere, and we want to put up signs. And while I recognize the importance of, of telling history and having this, uh, these are a luxury. These are not a necessity at this point in time. And uh, in, in my mind, when we have people losing jobs, uh, especially in state government and or elsewhere, um, and, and we have $20,000 to throw at signs since the wrong message. Um, you know, I, I just think that this is a luxury and not not a necessity. Um, I will also say that we don't have we don't have the the luxury of going out right now. And I do appreciate that there was some some discussion about bringing down the mixture of 50 50 as opposed to one to three and and having these other people uh, take take ownership of this. Well, what happens if these these organizations don't take ownership? Then the state of Wyoming is held uh, responsible for this. Uh, you know, the MOU is only enforceable while the organizations exist. And if those organizations no longer exist, then this falls back on the state of Wyoming to, to take care of these plaques and, and update them or, you know, take care of them on a regular daily basis. So um, while I appreciate the effort of this bill, and I, I am certainly a, a lover of the military and telling military history, and I do think this is a noble effort, I don't think this is the right time. I think this sends the wrong message to the people of Wyoming and certainly sends the wrong message to the to the citizens of Wyoming that are paying the taxes on fuel taxes uh, that we can't take care of the roads, but we can add plaques. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, with that, I'll, I'll relinquish and I'll stand off my pedestal, but uh, I'll be a no vote on this. Okay. Any other comment? Representative Burt. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have uh, followed the same um, the, the same discussion of uh, both Representative Brown and Stiver. Um, as a former military member myself, um, I do have a, a deep love for the military and I do appreciate everything that they, they do sacrifice for us. Um, but listening to the director's comments and everything that he's got out there, it doesn't sound like we actually need to push the bill in order for us to, uh, to put out memorials for, you know, for, for our fallen. It sounds like there's already a system in place for that. Um, and uh, with that, uh, I'm also be a no vote on this. Okay. 
Any other comments before we work the bill? No? Okay, so uh, first page, the amendments. Page two, Representative Squire. You'd already spoken up first, that's why I asked. We have an amendment on page two. Yes, Mr. Chairman. All right, please. Uh, well, and uh, it, it would be appropriate for uh, section two lines 14 through uh, 16, and that would be to amend the uh, match to a 50-50 match. And then also uh, at the appropriate time, or we can include it in the same amendment for time savings, uh, that the entity would also be responsible for an acceptable MOU with regard to the ongoing maintenance and uh, condition of the sign. Uh, Representative, let's do this. Um, because of the Zoom and, and virtual meeting, um, I'm going to take it a little slow on amendment. I hopefully help staff a little bit. Uh, with this. So let's do your first one, which is and I put some words to this, would be to change on line 15, three, one, and then change the numerical number to one uh, to make it one to one match. That is acceptable. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That would be just fine. Uh, and again, we're going to do this a little differently than we do sometimes. Carla, do you have? Adam. Yes, sir, I do. Hey, thank you. Oh, with that, I'll in the uh, just, uh, Mr. Chairman, Chairman, do we need a second? Yes. Mr. Chairman, you've got Rep. Henderson as a second. Okay. Thank you, Representative Henderson. Mr. Chairman, if I may, um, I, yeah. I just uh, I, I wanted to make sure we could maybe get that repronounced. You were breaking up pretty severely, and I've asked a few other members of the committee if they could understand you, and a few of them were having troubles too. So if we could have the one of one of the two uh, members recreate what the amendment is for right now, what we're voting on, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. I'll, I'll restate that for everyone. And again, if that happens, please speak up. Um, we, we knew there'd be trouble problems with, with Wi-Fi and everything else. So uh, I will repeat that line 15, page two, line 15, change the word three to one and the numerical number from three to $1. So that that line reads upon a match of funds in the ratio of $1 of other state funds to not less than $1 in matching funds, et cetera. Okay, so we have a, a second on that. All in favor of that amendment, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, eight, nine, amendment passes. Okay. Representative McGuire, you have another amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And that would be where it's appropriate. I believe it would be uh, between line 17 and 18 that the uh, non-state entity also engage or uh, have a MOU, an acceptable MOU for the ongoing maintenance and condition of the sign. Do you, do you have wording for that, Representative? I don't. I would prefer to let uh, LSO fill that in. I can work on it if you would like me to, but uh, um, uh, in, in fact, I just put it at the end of uh, line 18, creating and placing that memorial with an MOU with YDOT, uh, an acceptable MOU with YDOT for ongoing maintenance and condition of the site of the memorial. Okay. 
Okay. Is there a second on that? Second bio. Marla, do you have that or would you like to see it? Mr. Chairman, you're breaking up again. Thank you, Representative Brown. Am I better now? Thank you. Carla, do you have the wording on that amendment or do you need it repeated? Mr. Chairman, I believe I have the wording. It is at the end of, in section two, at the end of line 18, um, add with a acceptable MOU with the Wyoming Department of Transportation for ongoing maintenance of the memorial. And the second was O'Hearn. Okay, thank you. That's correct. Okay, all in favor, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, passes. Okay. Any other amendments on page two? Representative Obermuller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my amendment is on line three. And my amendment is to strike and the location of that line so that the adjutant general of Wyoming National Guard shall approve the design of each memorial at which the memorial is to be placed dropping the and the location which um, from the testimony of of um, director reiner the adjutant general really has no role in that location so or the approval of that location not any role in the in it but no a role in approving it okay so and sir right. anderson okay so let me just so i'm clear page two line three it would be changed to read memorial at the location. At which, yeah, just striking the words and the location. I'm not sure that actually reads well. If you just strike those two words, Representative. They're striking three words and Which, the location. Oh, and the location. Okay. Thank you. All right. Everyone clear on the amendment? Okay. All in favor, raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Who are we missing? Who, who dropped? Okay, Brown dropped off, so it is Brown's excuse. No, I'm sorry, Landon. Excuse me, Representative Brown. Representative Baker has dropped off. I'm sorry. We'll get this figured out. So, okay, that amendment passes. Any other amendments? Page two. And Carl, we can compare notes when we are done with this if you wish to make sure. Okay, page three, any amendments? No amendments. Committee? Someone wanna call for the question? Okay, Representative Stiver, call for the question. Carla, please uh, call the roll. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, this is on House Bill 0018 uh, for due pass. Representative Baker. Uh, excused for the moment. We'll, be, we'll see if we can get him back on. Okay. Representative Brown? No. Representative Burt? No. Representative Henderson? Aye. Representative Obermuller? Representative Obermuller, please. Aye. Representative O'Hearn? Aye. Representative Stivar? No. 
Vice Chair McGuire? Aye. Chairman Burkhart? Aye. Um, Five ayes. And let's, I want to leave this open uh, at least till we get back. We'll take a break, but at least until we get back from a, a quick break to see if we can get uh, Representative Baker back on. Yes. Do that. And with that, um, I'd indicated we'd take a break somewhere around 2.45. Um, let's take a 15 minute recess, uh, get coffee, whatever you need. And, and I guess, uh, Rihanna, we can let uh, Mr. Milliken and Director Reiner and General Porter uh, leave. Will do, Chairman Burkhart. Thank you. Uh, Representative General Porter. No, sir, just uh, was waving goodbye, sir. Sorry. Oh, about <laughs> thank you. Nope, thank you, sir. Appreciate it. So, Carla, uh, 15 minutes. We have 15 minutes, so, okay.
Rihanna, I think we're ready to go. Okay, great. Uh, a couple things before we get started. Uh, Representative Baker is still having some computer problems, uh, but it is on, he can hear us. And what I've told him is, is that based on uh, the rule we passed uh, last Tuesday, when we opened this session, he has to be on camera to participate. So um, if he asks a question, has an amendment uh, and to vote any of that, he will turn his camera on. Uh, also uh, for staff, uh, he's experiencing about a 30 second delay um, in getting a question or being called for, for a vote. Um, so just be easy with him. <laughs> Uh, you have to give him some time to respond. So uh, with that, Representative Baker, on that last bill on the military training memorials, I left the vote open for you. Uh, if you wish to vote, you'll have to appear in that. Um, and if I do that again, just so everyone knows, I will only leave it, the vote open until uh, uh, we adjourn. I won't leave a, a vote open beyond that. Um, so. Uh, that solves some problems we've had in the past with votes being left open uh, overnight or till the next meeting. Um, the, the vote closes at the uh, adjournment of the committee. So uh, with that, Carla, if you wanna get uh, Representative Baker's vote. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative Baker. Thank you, Carla, I'm an aye. Thank you. Okay. So the next bill for our consideration is uh, House Bill 19, Antique Motor Vehicles. And I'm going to let uh, Representative Brown take this through, uh, take us through this. Uh, and that last one, by the way, uh, rely on Representative Wire to floor manage that. Representative Brown, proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate it. Um, and uh, I think most of the committee is aware of this, but I will do a quick run through of the bill just to uh, kind of give everybody a heads up on what we're looking at here. Uh, this bill was a bill that uh, former Representative Laux and I had brainstormed many, many months ago uh, prior to his departure. And uh, this was something that we both saw as a, a little bit of an issue. And what we saw the issue was being is uh, many of these classic antique vehicles driving around uh, in our cities uh, and, and not really um, being used for the, the means that they're supposed to be used for. So uh, we decided to work this out a little bit. Um, I worked this in our second committee meeting of the interim. Brought, brought the bill, there was a lot of committee discussion, brought it back to the third committee meeting and it was discussed with some heavy amendments, which I'm perfectly okay with. Um, and the, the bill that we have in front of us is what came out of the interim committee. So I'll run through the bill really quick. Uh, what we're looking at doing is changing the terminology for a antique motor vehicle from 25 to 40 years. Uh, what that boils down to and the reason we're doing that is a car from 1996 right now would be considered an antique motor vehicle. Um, this is this seems to be uh, not necessarily the intent of what we're looking at doing. Uh, while we have some trade groups out there that still recognize this 25 year mark uh, to, to get a 25 year old car from 1996 and slap an antique motor vehicle on it, uh, played on it for $10 and be able to drive it uh, to and from shows or whatever uh, just didn't seem to be right. So we moved that back to 40 years. Uh, the other change that we did here is we added an annual certificate of compliance, basically saying that you're going to register this vehicle once a year, as opposed to paying a one-time fee when you register an antique motor vehicle right now, currently is in statute. It's $10. You get a $10 tag on there and you can drive that vehicle as long as you want. Um, and you never have to renew it or anything along those lines. So uh, this is an annual registration fee. This, the discussion surrounding this annual registration fee was if you have the money for a classic car, you probably have the money for a $50 registration fee uh, every single year. It, it still does not open or expand or contract uh, any of the opportunities for these vehicles to be used, which stays uh, currently in statute, to basically be used for parades, car shows, stuff like that. Um, another major issue on this is we do require insurance on this now. Uh, 
Previously, we did not require insurance for these antique motor vehicles, which did put other motorists at risk in case an accident or a crash occurred. Um, if you're going to be driving on Wyoming uh, roads, we do believe, uh, the, the previous committee did believe, that it was in best interest to have, uh, you know, at least liability insurance on this in case the accident of that other person. The thought surrounding this was, if there is a person that is wealthy enough to drive one of these vehicles and is self-insured and or has a uh, type of um, insured valuable asset as opposed to a motor vehicle asset, uh, they may not be willing to pay for the damages caused by their vehicle. So this just requires that if it's their fault, uh, they would have insurance to cover that. And then lastly, we have the grandfather clause in section two. And what section two says is before this bill is enacted, if there is cars that are uh, within this 25 year period right now, um, but less than the 40 years old, they can be registered up until that date and they will be allowed to stay in that current state. Uh, they do not have to register every single year or anything along those lines. So it basically gives a grandfather clause to those that are doing it. However, it says if they choose to go beyond this, if they transfer title or if they sell the vehicle, whatever the case may be, that's when the $50 fee per annum comes in and would be assessed on each one of these vehicles. Um, ultimately, what the overview is, is we have plenty of vehicles that are driving around on the roads right now and only required to register for $10. Um, this is, again, a very, very very nominal fee for uh, these cars driving up and down the roads um, and, and uh, just barely even being used. I understand that. However, uh, the $10 seems to be extremely too low in my opinion. Um, and what I would expect is that if you do have a car that falls within this line and you're taking it to car shows or parades, you probably have $50 a year. Uh, we're, we're talking less than $5 a month. Um, it, there has been some other emails uh, circulated to the committee, uh, and I wanted to address those head on first. Um, one thing that I will say is there the Montana issues of people registering vehicles outside as LLCs. That's beyond the purview of the bill that we're talking about, but it is an interesting discussion. Um, I do think that it's worth having that discussion, but I don't believe it's related directly to this. This committee has looked at addressing the LLC and registration issues with Montana LLCs for the entirety of my tenure in the legislature. And it just seems like we have a very hard time of addressing that issue. Um, however, uh, the costs that are associated with this, that people are worried about paying for this, I'm not so sure that I buy the argument that they can't afford a $50 registration fee. And then that has been raised multiple times. I don't know if it's been raised to the rest of the committee, but certainly to me. So uh, Mr. Chairman, with that, uh, that is the bill as is sponsored by, the, by this committee out of the interim. And with that, I'll stand for any questions. Okay. Thank you, Representative. Any questions for Representative Brown? Representative Henderson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative, uh, a great overview, uh, and I really want to try to support this, but I'm having trouble uh, understanding the difference between, you know, we have the Pioneer license, and now we have the Antique license. Is, is there a difference, really, or is, is there a distinction? Representative Brown? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There is no distinction. Uh, the Pioneer and Antique license plates are one and the same. Uh, the way that it was just described to me um, through the interim was uh, they are used interchangeably when discussing these. Uh, the, the plate themselves say pioneer. They do not say antique. We in statute refer to them as antique motor vehicles. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Representative Brown? Representative Stiber. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Uh, Representative Brown, was there a discussion on this LLC stuff during the committee meetings? Representative Brown? Mr. Chairman, Representative Skybar, there was not a discussion on this. Uh, this was just a recently an email that was, I believe, forwarded to the committee. I know I received it. Um, this discussion has been a topic of discussion for the Transportation Committee uh, all four years that I've been in the legislature. We have actually passed two bills in my tenure attempting to address this issue. Uh, unfortunately, what it boils down to is there's a, a very large uh, issue that it's much bigger than licensing a vehicle, I can assure you of that. 
uh, when it comes to LLCs and shell corporations and, and, and stuff like that. So um, unfortunately, uh, there's not much we can do about that at this point. And it is, again, like I said, it's outside the purview of this particular bill. And to answer your question directly, no, that discussion did not come up during uh, the support of this bill. Okay. Other questions for Representative Brown? Anyone else? Okay. Uh, Representative, I'm still not clear, so just please walk me through it. I wasn't here for the discussion um, during the interim on all of this. What was the logic to 40 years? I understand you said a, you know, a 1995 vehicle would be an antique, but why 40 years? Mr. Chairman, thank you. The, the, that's a really good question. And that actually came out of Representative Lax and I's discussions. Uh, originally, it was uh, 50 years, and then it was 10 years, and then it was 25. There was just a lot of discussion. And then frankly, the, the 25 doesn't really matter to me. Uh, the committee felt, um, you know, the, the, the movement forward was at, at 50 years, that was a bit too much. Um, but at 40 years, that seems like those would still be considered classic or antique cars. Uh, the, the feeling in the committee was words matter and antique does not necessarily mean 25 years. Again, I drove a, a 1996 Saturn uh, to school and I certainly would not consider that an antique vehicle um, if it even still runs. So um, I, that's really what it boiled down to, Mr. Chairman, is we, we all have an image of what an antique vehicle is. And the majority of those antique vehicles uh, fall within that 40, 30 year time frame, uh, not so much this 25 year time frame. Representative McGuire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just uh, for the benefit of those who are listening, just to make sure that people don't understand there's a mixing. You can drive a 1996 vehicle to school, but you can't do it with a Pioneer plate. And I would ask the question, is there anything, uh, is there any strong evidence that has been presented by either a county assessor or a police force or anything that uh, you know, shows how big or how small this problem is? Um, I would just invite uh, any comment about that. Thank you. Representative Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, Representative McGuire. Uh, to your question, not necessarily from the assessor or the treasurer's office. However, I have received um, some communications through my local law enforcement uh, that the invitate or the information that they have on law right now is, is fairly hard to enforce because really all statute says is, well, I have to be driving to or from a car show or a parade or something along those lines. And, and really the people who have these pioneer license plates know that. Um, what we see more often than not is anecdotal evidence, right? Uh, we see a lot of cars driving around on Saturday afternoons or Saturday mornings going to and from breakfast or to church or whatever the case may be. And, and you see it a lot more during the summer year or summer months than you do the winter months. And so it's, it is anecdotal um, and it is an issue of enforcement capability by our law enforcement. And frankly, uh, one of the discussions that was had during the committee meeting as well was the enforceability of this. And so there was a little bit of a discussion on maybe we don't see the enforcement issue of not having proper licensing um, if we just have that $10 license plate. But if we have a, a capability of having a sticker on there every single year and the, the law enforcement doesn't see the right color sticker, just like they don't see the right color sticker on our vehicles right now, uh, then they can enforce upon it a little easier. And so that was a, a topic of discussion as well. Okay. Thank you. Other questions for Representative Brown? Anyone else? So, Representative, I, I have a couple then. Um, the cost is $50 a year for a, an antique registration. Um, let's see, I'm, I'm looking at page six. So the annual validation sticker is $50. What's the, what's the registration for a, a vehicle? And I assume we're talking about the state registration. What's the registration uh, normally for a, a vehicle, say a, a run of the mill sedan, the state registration? Mr. Chairman, that's a good point. Uh, and, you know, again, anecdotally, we, we, we could come up with some numbers here. And actually that was a discussion that former representative Blake brought up. 
he has a, a 19, I believe, 76 Torino that he can license because everything is based off of MSRP on how licensing costs. And he can license that vehicle for around $44 a year. And he would get a standard plate that he can drive at any time and is not restricted. So it actually is more advantageous to a person who has an older vehicle that's based off of current MSRP values uh, to go and register that vehicle without a Pioneer or antique license plate. So to answer your question directly, I don't have those exact figures, um, but it is advent more advantageous in, in many cases for these people to pay the county fee and the current state fee and just be able to drive the vehicle as much as they want, as opposed to going and getting a Pioneer plate. Okay, so, um, and then, my other question is um, on the time frame in section two. Um, what happens to a, a vehicle that is, say, 30 years old that currently has a, an antique plate on it? Under this, what happens to that vehicle? Mr. Chairman, if they are 30 years old currently, um, they would not be able to apply for the uh, antique license plate. However, if they get it, so it says again in section two, this act applies to all vehicles as of July 1, 2021. If it's at least 25 years or older, but not a model year of 1979 or earlier, then they can take care of what they've currently got. So the 30 year old vehicle would not be uh, capable of getting the Pioneer license plate at this point. However, uh, after July 20, or after July 1st, they would be able to register this underneath the $50 per annum fee. Okay, all right. Okay, any other questions for Representative Brown? Okay, so with that, Carla, I'll, I'll take public testimony and I believe that uh, uh, General Reiner uh, and some of his staff wish to uh, testify. Yes, thank you. Rihanna is, is bringing those up. Okay. Director Reiner. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the committee. Uh, we, we would just jump on as, as White on say, hey, we, uh, we fully support this bill. Think it's, uh, there's, there's no issues with it. Um, we do appreciate the uh, actual, the insurance validation every year, I think that's helpful, and, and certainly the increase in revenue. So uh, with that, we stand for questions, but, uh, but would, would support the bill. Any, any questions for Director Reiner? Okay. All right, thank you, Director. Thank you. Um, I think next up is uh, Dan Schein. Did I pronounce that correctly, Mr. Schein? You certainly did, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you. Uh, you sent us a, a very nice uh, email, and I'm glad to see you're here to testify. Uh, so please proceed. Well, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, and thank you for allowing me to share my thoughts on what and questions here on House Bill 19 with you today. Um, I respectfully ask that you consider the items that I'm going to mention, and I'm certain that you will before you take your vote on this. And I'd also like to thank Representative Brown for addressing some of the items that were actually included in my email this morning um, regarding this effort. You know, I, I personally am an owner of an antique vehicle. I'm an auto enthusiast. I'm also someone who wishes to avoid the introduction of impediments that could affect future registration of antique vehicles in our state. And I certainly do support your effort of requiring antique vehicles to be insured. To that point, I, I'd like to mention some of the items that may not have been considered when, this, when these changes were proposed. Um, consider that several antique insurance policies, and there are companies out there who specify, who are, I'm sorry, focus on insuring antique vehicles. The reason as an antique owner you would go to one of those companies is because you get to work with them and negotiate the replacement cost, the value of your vehicle, right? I'm not limited to what the NAPA book says on my 1991, 1946, whatever it may be vehicle. I can agree with my insurance company what that vehicle is worth. To acquire that insurance, most antique uh, insurers require that my vehicle be registered as an antique. 
Therefore, the increase here from 25 to 40 years is going to have an impact on that. Um, I, I know Representative Brown had mentioned the LLCs, and that was certainly one of the things that was listed in my email. Um, I think that the LLCs and the fact that um, currently our legislation and the rules really don't clarify what the use of the antique vehicle are a problem. Um, the LLCs and, and setting that aside, but just looking at the fact that I could go to Montana and I can register my vehicle there for permanent registration for a fee of $87.50. It's, it's something that I personally do not wish to do, don't, I'm not going to do, but I can see where certain other people would do that. I think that the focus here should be to increase the cost of a Pioneer plate. Currently, Pioneer plates are $10. If I want a custom vehicle plate or a street rod plate, that costs me $100. So I think it's fair to increase the cost of a Pioneer plate. I also think that you need to consider changing the laws to clarify what is a legitimate use of a vehicle that carries a Pioneer plate. Turn this over to law enforcement. The same thing that law enforcement is charged with going after people who are running vehicles and residents of Wyoming with Montana plates, that's an enforcement issue. If we're if people are going to use these vehicles on the roadway to bypass paying their fair share of registration, then make that in a law enforcement issue as well. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that I could for the committee. And I thank you for your time and for listening to me. Well, thank you, Mr. Shine, very much for, for being here. So I think Representative Brown, you had your hand up first. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Shine, thank you very much for your email and, and very well thought out uh, points. I, I truly do appreciate uh, being able to, to read bullet points like that and, and get through emails quickly. So that's very, very much appreciated. To your, your point on the Montana LLC stuff, um, I'm curious if you uh, paid attention at all, and if you didn't, it's not a big deal, but if you paid attention at all back in 2017 when the House Transport, or I'm sorry, the Joint Transportation Committee uh, tried to do a rebuttable presumption on vehicle registrations within the state of Wyoming and, and being licensed in the state of Wyoming if you're a Wyoming resident. Uh, and, and if so, uh, did you have, when you were, if you did have that, uh, what was your input on that? And, and maybe whether or not you would support something along those lines as well. Will you hold it against me if I tell you that I've only been a Wyomingite since for two years? Well, actually, November was my one year anniversary here. <laughs> well, welcome to Wyoming, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> yeah, my, my wife and I relocated here from Pennsylvania. And my antique vehicle is sitting in my garage with a car cover over it for all winter. But I will say that both of our other vehicles, you know, have been registered and I have just a traditional Wyoming plate. It has been a surprise for me moving from Pennsylvania to Wyoming to realize how much it was going to cost me to register my vehicle. Um, however, then, you know, there are other financial benefits in the sense that I don't pay a state income tax. Right. Thank you, Mr. Shine. One, one thing to with the LLC issue, uh, I think that might be a little outside the, the realm of this bill. Uh, I think it's something that needs to be addressed. Um, I know it's come up before, it's been looked at, um, not successfully to address those issues. I believe there's a similar issue with uh, uh, Idaho as there is Montana. So uh, that might be something to look at in the interim, but uh, I think Right now, we'll just stick with this bill and, and see where this goes. So um, with that, well, okay, you got Representative Obermuller. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like, uh, I'd like Mr. Chairman to ask uh, Mr. Shine a question. Please. Uh, Mr. Shine, being involved in the uh, antique vehicle world, uh, and part of this bill has to do with uh, what an antique vehicle is. So just, and it's kind of a sense of those things. So if I showed up at an antique show with my 1994 ST Blazer, uh, would people think that that belonged in that group or would they kind of look sideways at that? Well, Mr. Shine? 
I think it depends on the, on the group, right? Um, in, in Pennsylvania, I will tell you that there were actually exemptions for what would be considered a historic Bitcoin, very similar to here, where we refer to an antique and we refer to a pioneer. Um, in Pennsylvania, at one point in time, the place actually said antique on them, but they now say historic vehicle on them. There are carve outs in the Pennsylvania law, for example, if a vehicle is no longer in production, regardless of how old it was. So if it was a limited run vehicle and that vehicle may have only may only be 10 years old, um, that vehicle is eligible for historic plates. Um, you know, and, and to Representative Brown's point, um, I saw people in Pennsylvania that drove vehicles that were tagged with historic and antique plates as their daily drivers. That is not what it was intended for. And it was certainly a way of them having to avoid in Pennsylvania going through an annual safety inspection on their vehicle. Um, that's not the intent of it, and it certainly should be enforced that that should be changed. But, but to your point, I think that when I go to a show and I look at vehicles, if it's a well-preserved vehicle, I'm, I'm happy to view it. But then again, I'm an auto enthusiast. You know, this morning I reached out to Park County where I live. I live in Cody. I reached out to our treasurer's department and I asked them if they could tell me how many vehicles uh, or at least how many license plates have been issued of the Pioneer plate in our county. They don't know that number. So they had to come back to the DMV. They called me later on before this meeting and said that the DMV cannot tell them how many vehicles are number one registered in Park County as a Pioneer plate but they can't even tell them how many vehicles in the state of Wyoming carry Pioneer plates. And the reason for that is Pioneer plates are never turned in. That vehicle may have been crushed or been sitting in a field somewhere for years, and that plate's hanging on a barroom wall in somebody's garage. So at this point in time, no one really seems to know how many are out there. Um, but, but I think, that, again, when you go to a car show, getting back to your, your original question, I think it depends on the vehicle, the condition of the vehicle, and the group of people that are there looking at your vehicle. Okay. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, other questions? I thought there was someone else, and, and you have to forgive me because I think you experience the same thing. The screen resets periodically so you don't get uh, lock up on the screen. So some of you move around, and that's why it kind of confuses me momentarily. So um, any other questions for Mr. Shine? Well, this is, this is Mark Milliken. Can I Milliken, say something? Please wait, Mr. Milliken, please wait. I'm sorry I, to be so wordy here with two <laughs> bills, but I am a owner of antique vehicles. I have two okay. cars with these plates. Mr. And Milliken, please wait for your turn, please. Okay. So any other questions for, for Mr. Shine? Okay, Mr. Shine, thank you very much for, for being very much. participating. Um, wait a minute, Representative Brown? Nope, Mr. Chairman, I was just saying thank you and welcome to Wyoming to Mr. Shine. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Representative McGuire? I think you need to take take over here. I think we've lost our chairman. Anybody? Oh, there we go. We got him. Did I just lose everybody? You did, but you're back, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. So another question is for Mr. Shine. Thank you again. I apologize. Uh, the wonderful world of electronics. So... Uh, with that, uh, Mr. Milliken, please. Uh, just, just very, very briefly, I own two of these vehicles with these Pioneer plates, and I don't have a problem with what's being proposed here, but I looked at the bill, and the revenue stream that's being projected, I think, is kind of grossly overestimated. I think the requirements of the Pioneer plate, the regulation state that the usage of the vehicle is so highly restricted that it's very it's almost impossible to drive them legally if you if you go by the strict interpretation of the of the uh, of the law 
And uh, that's why you never very rarely ever see them on the street. People don't want to get pulled over and get a ticket. So if you're going to start charging $50 for these every year, I think you're, I think the number of registrations I think is going to plummet. And I don't think you're going to see anywhere near the, the revenue stream that you're talking about. Also, what is the, what is the, uh, what is the administrative cost to the state for a $50 uh, registration? Is it going to exceed $50? Are we going backwards here? So I guess that, that would be my only concern. And thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Milliken. Okay. Uh, I think, uh, Mr. Rossetti, you're, you're up next. Good to see you again. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Taylor Rossetti, Support Services Administrator at YDOT. Um, j just a couple of things that have come up here. The, the rebuttable presumption bill uh, did actually make it through and, and it did pass in 2017. It was enrolled Act 95. Um, <laughs> so, but, but to your guys' point, the, that is still actually you know, being worked out. We, we have had a couple of hearings scheduled. There has been nothing that's actually gone through that entire administrative process as of yet. We have had a few folks, and I, I say a few, it's a limited number of people, who upon receiving notification have actually gone ahead and moved their registrations out of Montana or Idaho into Wyoming. So, so there is a law out there that does, does take that into effect. Um, the, the other thing is, as Mr. Milliken, the previous speaker just mentioned, and it, it, it's already in statute, but it's not part of this bill, so it might be unclear, but it, it's sitting in 312-223, which actually stipulates what these vehicles can be used for. And that reads as follows, Mr. Chairman. The vehicle is owned and operated solely for the purpose of organized antique car club activities, parades, exhibitions, tours, and other related activities, and will not be used for general transportation. Um, so so that, that kind of gives you an idea of, of the intent of what these vehicles should be used for. Um, but, but with that, Mr. Chairman, I, I just thought I'd clear up those two things as there were several questions along those lines. I'd stand for anything you may have for me, sir. Thank you, Mr. Rossetti. Any questions for Mr. Rossetti? Any questions? Okay, well, thank you. Carla, do we have anyone else standing by? I do not see anybody, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. So I think you can, you can release Mr. Shine. Okay, and with that committee, what's your pleasure? Chairman, move the bill. The bill's been moved by Representative Brown, seconded by Representative O'Hearn. Okay, guess just work the bill. Uh, anything on page one? Page two. Page three. Page four. Page five. And I do have an amendment somewhere. Let me find it. Oh, okay. Uh, on page five, line nine, uh, I would propose changing the date from 10 days to 45 days, and if I get a second, I'll explain that. Okay, seconded by Representative Brown. Okay, my explanation for that is currently, if you buy an, a regular vehicle, you buy a, I don't know, 2010 truck from your neighbor or something, you have 45 days to register. If you buy from a dealer, you have 60 days. So it just makes it consistent. I don't see where, uh, we uh, need to, to put 10 days from the time you, you purchase it 
uh, maybe bring it into the state. Most of these are not going to be purchased from dealers uh, within Wyoming. They'll be purchased from uh, probably private owners. So just to be, it's just a consistency issue. Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I'm double checking. I actually think we've moved that to 60 days. Um, I, I'm checking with my county uh, treasurer right now. I just sent her an email. I, I think that your amendment is spot on and I don't see any issues with it, but uh, just for, like you say, uh, complete um, you know, transparency and whatnot, trying to keep it all the same. Uh, I, I think, yeah, I just got an email from her that says 60 days is correct. So um, as the second, I would motion to, to amend to 60 days if you're comfortable with that, Mr. Chairman. That's a friendly amendment. Okay. Any other discussion on the amendment? So change the change line nine on page five to read register the vehicle within 60 days from the date of acquisition. And that's a consistency issue. Okay. All in favor, raise your hand. Okay, we have nine. Okay. Page six, anything? Okay, Representative Baker. You just muted yourself again. Okay, there you go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would move on line 15 and line 17 to delete the new language. So delete 50 and delete 10. That would be keeping the uh, annual validation sticker for um, those that aren't grandfathered in, but um, also keeping the current um, initial license plate the same cost. Okay, Representative Baker, so just to be clear, your amendment is to uh, leave line 15 at $10, leave line 17 at $2, but leave in the annual validation sticker. Correct, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Is there a second? Seconded by Representative Stiver. Okay, discussion? Representative Brown? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would gently push back, like barely. Um, I, it, this really doesn't matter to me. I, I do feel that, I mean, if you're gonna pay $50 a year, I don't know that doing it the first time is why the first time wouldn't be any different. Um, you know, the initial registration would be the initial registration of $50. It's not gonna be 10 and then 50. So um, that beyond the, the, the $2 uh, fee and whatnot, again, I don't really have a, super heavy duty push on this. So um, I would uh, I would gently push back and just say, if, if, if they've got the money to own an antique vehicle, I certainly don't see the point that this is going to deter people from buying antique vehicles. You're talking vehicles that are, you know, well worth in the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of value, $50 is certainly not going to make or break those banks, but that would be off Mr. Chairman. Okay, any other discussion on the amendment? Representative Baker. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate that discussion. Uh, the reason I brought the amendment is just looking at the fiscal note that most of the revenue generated from this will still be uh, generated with keeping that C, the validation sticker in there. Um, so it's really about the appearance too, um, allowing those people that are gonna still continue to do this and do wanna pursue this as, as their option that they have that incentive for that low cost initial uh, initial registration. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Any other discussion on the amendment? Okay, all in favor, raise your hand. One, two, three, four. Four, amendment fails. Okay. Any other amendments? A page seven. Okay. Question on the bill, Mr. Chairman. Question having been called. Carla, would you please call the roll? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. For a due pass as amended, House Bill 19, 
Um, Representative Baker. No. Representative Brown. Aye. Representative Burt. Aye. Representative Henderson. Aye. Representative Obermuller. Aye. Representative O'Hearn. Aye. Representative Stivar. No. Vice Chair McGuire. Aye. And Chairman Burkhart. No. That's six yes and three no. Okay. Uh, bill passes. Representative Brown, will you floor manager, please? Hey. Right. And that leads us to the last bill for our consideration, uh, which is tribal vehicle registration exemption implementation. And I believe that uh, Representative uh, Lloyd Larson was going to present this on behalf of the Tribal Relations Committee. Is okay, he's ready. Can you see me, Mr. Chairman? Uh, not yet. Lucky you. It takes a minute. There you are. You see your smiling face. Thank you. Uh, tell us about your bill. So, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, this <clears throat> just just a little precursor. This this bill came comes through the Select Committee on Tribal Relations, which you really call. We um, have now given statutory authority to sponsor legislation and then that legislation because it is a select committee comes back to a standing committee uh, for the topic of which the the bill draft is uh, is warranted and that in this case is of course is your committee uh, the history behind this bill is back in the early 90s in there was a case in Oklahoma where <clears throat> the, uh, it was ruled that uh, because of the sovereignty of the Indian nations, the um, those people who had uh, vehicles and were living on the reservation were should not be required to pay the vehicle registration, and consequently, that um, was that um, consideration for that ruling came here in Wyoming. We adopted uh, legislation that. Um, allows for a waiver for vehicle registration if the if the individual is an enrolled member of the Eastern Shoshone tribe or the Northern Arapaho tribe and are living within the exterior boundaries of the reservation. And so <clears throat> the this statute really um, has an impact largely on Fremont County and some on Hot Springs County. What we heard as a tribal relations committee was concerns back from those people who are uh, getting their vehicles registered and applying for that waiver. And I, and I should point out that <clears throat> when uh, the county treasurer then is responsible to keep track of the number of registrations that they waive the registration fees to, and then the state treasurer's office is required to reimburse them for those fees. And so that's how the county is compensated for those fees. Uh, we had um, uh, members of the uh, of the Rapaho and Shoshone tribe that come to us and said it's kind of a, you know, we we go in the first time we verify that um, we live on the reservation, we're an enrolled member, and we have this vehicle, and then we have to come back each year um, to do the same thing when when they have the record on file. Why couldn't we just say? <clears throat> um, why couldn't we just say when I come in the first time on this vehicle that it's good for the life of the vehicle as I own it, unless I move or something changes that would warrant me uh, paying for that registration, and then when I change vehicles, then I would have to go through the process again, and in essence, that's what this bill does. It it uh, allows the uh, tribal member to come to the county treasurer's office, verify that he's an enrolled, he or she is an enrolled member of the tribe, provide um, uh, uh, 
verification of address being on the reservation. And then they're allowed that regist registration exemption. And this would allow that to be for the lifetime of uh, that for um, ownership of that car by that individual. If the individual <clears throat> moves off the reservation or ceases to be an enrolled member of the tribe, then they would be required to report that back to the county treasurer's office and would be responsible for uh, paying those registration fees. The, the question came back to the county treasurer um, on how would we provide them with the information to know that they have to notify the treasurer's office in the event that, uh, that their residence changes and they have the means in the uh, county treasurer's office to print that notification on the registration form, and, and that's part of the bill too. That they notify them that if they, if they're at, if if something changes there, that they're required to notify the county treasurer's office in within sixty days and uh, of of that move. Um, our questions back to the. Uh, County Treasurer's Office during our committee meetings was, um, does this adversely impact you in any way for collecting fees? Um, the answer to that was uh, no. Um, in managing the county staff, uh, there's sometimes the, that uh, folks will come in either on the veterans exemption or on this exemption and express frustration and um, they have to dif diplomatically handle those situations, but but work through them. Uh, they were largely supportive <clears throat> of this move. Um, the The question was, well, how do you verify that they're uh, that they maintain ownership of that vehicle through the the life of that vehicle? And they indicated that that um, historically that they didn't feel like that they've had a lot of difficulty. Uh, um, with those type of issues in that the person has to come in now and verify that they live on the reservation. And so uh, could there be mischief there that they uh, don't actually live on the reservation and are applying for that exemption? Um, probably like any other statute that we have, um, if, if you really work at it, there's a way around it. Uh, they didn't feel that it had, it had been a problem historically um, you know, uh, and that uh, verifying that they retain ownership, um, he didn't think, they didn't think that it was a problem back to uh, collection of those fees or um, a violation of statute. So, Mr. Chairman, I'm, I'm happy to go through the bill or try to answer any questions that you might have. So, uh, Representative Baker and then Stiver. Thank you, Mr. You're good. You're good. Now you aren't. There Thank you, you Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Larson. Um, just for informational purposes, maybe, or educational purposes, I'm just wondering why being an enrolled member isn't qualification enough for this exemption. Like you said, veterans, they just being a veteran is qualification enough. We don't say, hey, you have to live in, you know, Rock Springs or Green River or, or Lander. We say you're, you're in Wyoming. So I'm just wondering why these, uh, just being a member of this tribe isn't uh, an, enough to qualify for this exemption. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Lar Chair uh, Representative Larson. Thank you. And Representative Baker, it, it really is a great question. And for, <clears throat> for those who aren't, you know, kind of dealing with, with tribal issues, th the matter comes really back down to Indian country and the sovereignty that exists on the reservation. So they're, they're a sovereign government that, and, and the basis for that exemption isn't because they're an enrolled member of the church, it's because of the sovereignty of that nation that are governed within the external boundaries of, of the reservation that don't have, that the state statutes don't apply to. So they have their own tribal law and order code. They, for civil offenses, they take care of those through that tribal law and order code. It doesn't go through a, a district court or, or things of that nature. And so uh, likewise, when they buy a vehicle, 
if if they come and that vehicle is delivered to them on the reservation, then they're exempted from the sales tax on that vehicle as well. And, and, and it has nothing to do with the fact that they're an enrolled member of those two tribes, but a matter of recognizing their sovereignty as a government within the state of Wyoming. Uh, Representative Stiver was next, then Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chairman. Uh, Representative Larson, with the veterans exemption, I mean, and this is what I don't, I'm trying to get straight in my mind. If somebody's got a letter from the VA saying they're 100% 100 total and permanent, they have to bring that letter, a new letter, every year up to verify to get the plates. What's the difference here? Just well, the verification part of this. Larson? Mr. Chairman and Representative Stivar, yeah, I, I think you're spot on. We asked that question, and the question is, is so why are we requiring that of the veterans? And it may be something that this committee, where it's over Veterans Affair, may want to consider in the future. Is it really necessary to require those guys to come in each year, as long as they own that car, to, to verify that they're worthy of that exemption? Uh, I think it's a fair quest. We try to make the uh, we try to make government as unburdensome as we can. Re Representative Stiver, I think there might be a, a thought for a maybe a personal bill there. So, uh, Representative Brown. So, Mr. Chairman, I have two questions. Um, the first one. Hold on, just a second. Representative Stiver. Yeah, uh, Representative Larson, we need to talk because that's a good idea. <laughs> Right, Representative Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have two questions, um, if I may. Representative Larson, so am I understanding correctly that this is already done in statute? This is just clarifying how the process is being, how the plates are being procured, is that correct? Representative Larson. Mr. Chairman and Representative Brown. So the exemption is already in statute. The current, the current statutory language requires them to come in every year, verify for the same vehicle, the same vehicle that they owned last year, that, they're, that they are entitled to that exemption. Our change to the statute just says you have to come in the first time, you have to physically come in the first time to the, the treasurer's office and, and show that you're uh, living on the reservation, you're an enrolled member, and you did, did this vehicle is um, it qualifies for that exemption. And then the the following years, as long as you own that car, you don't you can you know apply by mail like we most of us do anyway, and wouldn't have to come physically come in to do that until. And unless you move off the reservation. And, and this, Mr. Chairman and, and Representative Brown, this kind of goes back to uh, Representative Baker's question. Once they move off the reservation, then they're required like every other citizen of the state to comply with state law and pay that registration fee. But while, but while on the reservation as an enrolled member, they qualify um, as, as uh, a member of that sovereign nation. Second question. Representative Brown. Thank you. I, this is actually just kind of a, a, a food for thought. Do you know how much the state reimburses uh, Fremont County and or the tribal area? And I, if you don't have it, it, it's not a big deal. I'm just kind of curious because I've been in discussions with a few people down here, like our DV plates, as, as Representative Stivar just mentioned. Uh, here in Cheyenne, we're, we're, the state is paying out upwards of $8 million a year to Laramie County for, for DV plates. Um, you know, that's, that's real money. So I'm just kind of curious out of this, what, what kind of real money we're talking about in Fremont County with these plates as well. So, uh, Mr. Chairman and Representative Brown, uh, uh, even a blind child gets an acorn once in a while. And because uh, uh, we had this discussion in the treasurer's office budget, because they're responsible to pay that back. Uh, and they had reduced, they, they were going to, in, in part of their step three reductions, were going to uh, eliminate a part of that. And so the question was, is would that leave the county 
holding the bag for these funds that the state is requiring them to comply with. And it comes up in a biennium of about 300,000 that they do. And so um, that's, that's where that's at. Thank you. Representative McGuire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I uh, wanted to follow up on that line of questioning. I'm just I am struggling to understand. So if the county is not eligible to receive those funds and the, the vehicle is basically on the reservation, why is the state reimbursing the county for that vehicle? I guess I don't understand why there's that connection. Thank you. Representative Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Representative McGuire. Uh, that kind of gets into the complexity of that um, uh, reservation state relationship. And so um, the, the resident, so, so the statutes say that, um, that the, um, I'm looking here to find it, that the, the vehicle is, uh, that they reside within it and uh, within the exterior boundaries, but yet that vehicle doesn't necessarily stay solely within the the boundaries of the reservation. And there's also county funding that comes back in and goes towards reservation for some road maintenance and, and bridge maintenance and, and, and things of such. And so it's not completely segregated as far as funding goes. And so th there, there, there are costs to the county uh, for providing services on the reservation, such as ambulance and stuff like that. And so they felt that uh, those services that are generally funded through these type of fees, um, that the county is going to be impacted negatively by. And so when they initially set that up, they says, we're going to require this, uh, this exemption, but uh, and, and the counties are going to be out these fees and still be required to provide services. And so then the treasurer's office has to reimburse them for those fees. I, did that answer that, Representative McGuire? Uh, Representative McGuire? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One more question. Yes, I appreciate your answer. So currently, if one of these vehicles is on a state highway and is stopped by a law enforcement official, and he asked the typical question, license and registration. What, when the individual who owns that vehicle hands over, is there anything on the registration that shows that it has been reissued with a different date or how, how do they get by with that? Mr. Chairman and Representative McGuire. So it would be no, the, the registration is gonna be a typical county registration, just like we normally have. The only difference on this registration is it's gonna have some language. And if you look on page three of the bill that it says, if a claimant's eligibility for the tribal member a residential exemption changes, the claimant shall notify the county. And so it's gonna have that on there. And, 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 a, and uh, a, an officer who pulls over somebody on a state highway on or off the reservation and looking at that registration would know that they, they uh, qualified for that exemption. Okay. Other questions for Representative Larson? Representative O'Hearn. Mr. Chairman, Representative Larson, um, I'm concerned about the insurance. Every time I license a vehicle, I have to prove that I have insurance every year. Um, and it all, we all do. And that's why I like that uh, Representative Brown's thing about the insurance on the antique vehicles. What's the, uh, what's the insurance on them? If Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman and Representative O'Hearn, good question, and it's exactly the same. That doesn't change. They they have to they they so so when 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 I send in for my registration via the mail, I have to send in a certificate of insurance that says that it's still insured, and they would have to do the same. They just don't have to be there in person. Okay. Other questions for Representative Larson? Other questions? Okay. Thank you, Representative Larson. Please hang with us here. Thank you. Thank you, committee. Is there anyone waiting to speak on this bill?
Mr. Chairman, yes, there is. And um, Rihanna's bringing him up. Okay, I will uh, open this to public comment. Travis McNiven. <clears throat> hey there, good to see you again, Travis. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman. Is, can uh, all the technology working here? Yes, we can see you and hear you. Thank you very much. I will be very brief. Uh, Representative uh, Larson, Chairman Larson of the Tribal Relations Committee did a very good job of, of laying out the bill. Uh, my name is Travis McNevin. I'm here on behalf of the North. Uh, Mr. McNevin, you just went away. Uh, Arapaho Business Council. You're, Mr. McNevin, you're breaking up severely. The, the council wishes to uh, thank you. Are you able to hear me? We can hear you. All right, my, it says my video is a little bit unstable, so may I continue with just uh, voice? Please. Um, so uh, the business council, Northern Apple Business Council wants to thank uh, co-chairs Ellis and Larson and members of the select committee on tribal relations for advancing this bill during the 2020 interim and appreciates their efforts. The council uh, puts its full support behind the bill and believes the bill reduces the, the burden on tribal members who wish to utilize this exemption has been explained uh, instead of from, a, from yearly of going in, being able to uh, do that and utilize that exemption once. There's, in the, I know the, the hour is late and the and co-chair Larson did a great job of, of laying out uh, the bill. So under the current statute, tribal members are required to submit a claim for every tribal individual uh, listed, and that must be done, as he mentioned, every, every year. And so the Northern Apple Business Council believes this change will benefit Northern Apple members and, and gladly supports all efforts to support this bill and appreciates the opportunity to uh, testify on their behalf today. Thank you, Chairman. Any questions for Mr. McNiven? Anyone have any questions? Okay, guess not. Mr. McNiven, thank you very much. Thank uh, you, Chairman. Anyone else wishing to speak on the bill? Carla, anyone else waiting? No, sir, I do not see anybody. Okay, all right, thank you. So, committee? Move the bill, Mr. Chairman. Okay, moved by Representative Brown, seconded by Representative O'Hearn. Okay, I guess go through the bill. Uh, Representative Chairman Larson, if you would just bear with us for a minute. So page one, page two, page three, Any changes? Any discussion? Question. Okay. Question having been called. Carla, would you please take the roll? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Vote on to do pass on House Bill 25. Representative Baker? Aye. Representative Brown? Aye. Representative Burt? Aye. Representative Henderson? Aye. Representative Obermuller? Aye. Representative O'Hearn? Aye. Representative Stivar? Aye. Vice Chairman McGuire? Aye. And Chairman Burkhart? Aye. Representative Larson, I imagine you'll carry the bill on the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I or one of the, the committee members will. We appreciate uh, it. It's really fun to be with you guys today. Thank you. Oh, well, that was a that was a first. That we're a fun group today. Mr. Chairman, I spend all morning with appropriations. You're a joy. Oh, thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Thank you. And with that committee, uh, that concludes our work for the day. Uh, done ahead of schedule. Uh, we had till 5.30. Uh, we're done with my clock says it's 4.21. Um, any Hold on, feedback? Mr. Chairman. 
What's that, Representative? Okay, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Any feedback on the on the meeting, Representative McGuire? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Could you just, uh, and I know that it's a move, bit of a moving target, but could you just explain to us what you see moving forward as uh, what's going to happen with the, the bills and our committee and things until maybe the beginning of next month? Thank you. Okay. Uh, for everyone and that, <clears throat> and, and first, before I do that, I really want to thank uh, Carla Smith and, and Rihanna Davidson for helping with this. This is job. This isn't what they normally do. Uh, they, they've done a fine job. Uh, thank you both very much. So to answer that question, um, we will go into session on the 25th. I think that's the date. Uh, 25th or 27th. I can't remember the, the date. I have it written down. It's one of those two dates. We will go into an eight-day session. Uh, virtual session. The, one of the first topics will be re-referral of bills to appropriations, though any with a, an appropriation to it will be re-referred so that they can start working them uh, very quickly. Uh, we will work those bills. Um, I think the House and Senate will both work the bills uh, three days, uh, get them out of the, the chamber of origination uh, I think the fourth day is a crossover day, and then we will work uh, the Senate bills, and they will work ours. And after eight days, we will adjourn with those bills, um, however they, they end up, whether they pass, fail, and that. Then in February, right now, and this is today, uh, like I've told you before, this could change literally by the time we close this committee meeting will be to do this again the 27th Heather Heather has told me um, we will do this again we will we will take up the rest of our committee bills uh, in February uh, we'll handle them the same way uh, and go back into a potentially another eight-day session uh, to take care of all the committee bills and I believe to start looking at the budget bill um, which we have to have plenty of time for. It is anticipated that sometime around the end of February, 1st of March, and while there are dates, I'm not putting, I'm not even putting them on my calendar yet. I'm just keeping the whole thing open. We will go into an in-person session and that for approximately, I think that would work out to be somewhere around 20 days, give or take of work days uh, for individual bills. Yes, Representative Brown, are, are you chuckling at the same thing I am trying not to? I think so, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> All right. So anyway, that's kind of the schedule right now. Uh, the in-person session in the Capitol will depend on a lot of things, including uh, things such as uh, March, okay, Heather is, is filling in for me and she says March 1st through April 2nd is what we're looking at for an in-person session. Um, and it, but that depends on vaccines, on other things, <coughs> excuse me, and the, and the like. So that's kind of a rough one. I, I would tell you to kind of keep your schedules open. I know that, that for Representative Burt, that's very tough. He, he needs to be able to plan ahead and, and this doesn't help him much at all. Some of us, you know, we're day to day anyway. So, um, but that's what it's looking like right now. Uh, I, you know, I prefer an in-person format myself. Uh, I wish that I could, we could have done this in person uh, from the Capitol, at least some sort of hybrid meeting, uh, but management shot that down. And for right now, I will, not give them too much grief over it. Um, I, but I think we need to, to start looking at the potential to the next time we meet to do a hybrid. Um, and that, that's just my position, uh, but I'm not going to you know, push the issue uh, and, and that to the point of, of causing problems. Um, I can see both sides. Uh, I prefer the hybrid meeting, that's me. I think, all, or the in-person meeting, I think that's all of us. 
Um, you know, I, I would use Representative Byrd as an example. I imagine this is ridiculously hard on you, Marshall, because you don't get a chance to, to interact. None of us do. And that's, that's the issue. That's how we work these things. You know, we'll, we'll have conversations, uh, you know, morning, lunch, evening over bills. We'll work them ourselves and that and, and move on. Um, but that's that interaction is important. Go ahead, Marshall, please. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, you know, with that, and I know I'm, you know, a lot of um, a lot of the legislator, they, you know, kind of kind of individual retired or, or self-employed, it kind of you have that flexibility on that in where where this where the unknown schedule comes from, um, it does put a huge burden on on the employers out there that do employ us. Um, with me, with me specifically, I do work for the railroad, and my job is federally mandated. And not being able to let my employer know what I'm doing, it, it's kind of tough for them to be able to fill my job. So, I do appreciate you know being able to to meet virtually here like this. But uh, um, I wish that we just could have just continued on from last Tuesday, move it on, get it, get it done out of the way instead of, you know, this, you know, pick and choose our days. So, but I do appreciate, appreciate, uh, you know, uh, my first committee meeting that it does uh, uh, a new process for me. So thank you everybody. Okay. All right. Uh, Representative McGuire, did that kind of answer your question a little bit? I know it's kind of vague and I don't have much more than, than that. I do have a schedule, uh, but like I said, I'm, I'm assuming it's gonna change. So anything else? Did this work okay for everybody? Kind of, at least. Okay. Um, you know, with, 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 with Representative Baker and, and his connectivity issues, that was an on the fly call to, to let him participate as long as he was visible uh, to vote. And that, that uh, to me, that was the important thing that people know he's actually there. And, and I think all of you did a great job of not blacking yourselves out and doing other things. So thank you. And that, uh, thank you for the questions. Thank you for the understanding. Um, and with that, I guess uh, 